When Daniel Arp Moy took over the helm of the presidency of Kenya in 1978, there was widespread expectation among the public that a democratic and a human rights-oriented political space would be put in place by his administration. During Kenyatta's presidency, not this one, yes, that one, the economic and political space in the country was dominated by a small clique of elites known as the Kiambu Mafia from his ethnic group, the Kikuyus, and their loyalists. This group undermined Kenyatta's nationalistic and populist background alienating other ethnic groups as well as non-conforming Kikuyus. Even though he remained loyal to Kenyatta as the vice president from 1967 to 1978, Moi was generally an outsider of Kenyatta's inner cabinet, and as such was regarded by Kenyans to be the right candidate to steer the country towards a more accommodative and democratic direction. This is the story of Daniel Arap. Moi. Tirotich Arab Moi was born in 1924 in the poor villages of Kulingwo in Balingo County. He grew up to embody the true meaning of his surname, Tirotich, which loosely translates to Welcome Home, the Kato, when he led Kenyans as a herd of Kato, weeping, commandeering, and herding them into total submission to his suppressive and totalitarian rule. In fact, in a subtle, wicked symbolism, Moi was known for his trademark rungu, a wooden baton traditionally used for hunting and combat, which he carried with him everywhere. This rungu was metaphorically emblematic of his politics and its subsequent totalitarian excesses. Born to a peasant family, Moi was orphaned at the age of four and so his elder brother became his guardian throughout his childhood. At an early age, his uncle, who was a colonial chief, helped Moi to get an education, recommending him to a missionary school in Kabatonjo in 1934. It was here that Moi was so excited about the ideals of Christianity that he adopted his Christian name, Daniel. Moi would then steadily grow his education, eventually becoming a teacher after graduating from Tambacha Teachers Training College at the tender age of just 21 years. He worked in different schools in the region, ascending to the position of head teacher. He remained in the teaching profession until 1955. Unlike many post-independence African leaders, Moi's rise to power was not out of being well-connected or having a foreign education. His journey into politics was a humble and a pragmatic one. He determined early in his career life that he could edge out a reputation from his teaching profession, which solidified the importance he attached to discipline and order. Coupled with his Christian fundamentalism, Moi developed a reputation of hard-working, sober, and a potentially moderate African leader in the eyes of colonial officials. Owing to this positioning, the British officials selected him to attend a special civics course in 1953, and two years later, he was elected as a member of the Legislative Council in the British colonial government. In the position, he was part of the Kenyan delegation at the Lancaster House Conferences in London, which drafted the first post-independence constitution. His political beacon happened in 1961, when he was appointed the Minister of Education in the pre-independence government. The self-professed professor of politics showed his political acumen earlier in his political career. Barely five years into elective politics, he co-founded the Kenya African Democratic Union, CADU, in 1960, a political alternative to the Kenya African National Union, KANU, led by Jomo Kenyatta. He later agreed to drop Kadu and join Kanu in 1964, a move that earned him respect from the founding president, Jomo Kenyatta. Kenyatta rewarded his gesture of goodwill with a ministerial appointment in the Home Affairs docket and soon promoted him to the position of vice president in 1967, a position he held until he became president after Jomo Kenyatta died in 1978. 
At the beginning of his reign as president, Moi was a darling of the people, both locally and internationally. He toured the country extensively, coming into contact with civilians, which was a significant contrast to Kenyatta's autocratic leadership style, mostly from behind closed doors. In his dictatorial honeymoon, he released 26 political prisoners, most of whom had been languishing in jails for years. He also reassured Kenyans that his administration would not condone drunkardness, tribalism, corruption, and smuggling problems that were already deeply entrenched in Kenya's social, economic, and political life. In addition, his financial generosity to local fundraisers, frequent tours of the countryside, free school milk, and an excellent memory for names and faces kept him popular with many across the country. Through his Nyayo philosophy, a pledge to follow in the footsteps of his predecessor, Moi endeared himself towards the more connected and entrenched Chikuyu community to solidify his national and regional legitimacy. His tenure as the president of Kenya has been referred to in Kenya's political and historical lexicons and in popular culture as the Nyayo era, rather than era. Well, this is because under his rule, Moi embraced, entrenched, and contuned the one party rule of the Kanu Party and its totalitarian legacy inherited from Kenyatta. Under his kleptocracy, any hopes of a democratic rule were dashed. Activists and intellectuals deemed subversive were jailed en masse, leading to a massive brain drain in the 1980s and 90s. The globally renowned novelist Ngugi Wationgo and Nobel laureate Wangali Mathai were among those that languished in prisons during his tenure. Moreover, corruption and nepotism flourished in the state institutions. In 1982, an attempted coup d'etat transformed Moi into a solid, intolerant, obnoxious and a dictatorial leader driven by raw obsession of flexing state machinery to remain in power. The coup was quickly quashed, and Moi used it as an opportunity and excuse to dismiss political opponents and consolidate his power. The main conspirators were sentenced to death and appointed his supporters to key roles in government and changed their constitution to formally make Kanu the only legally permitted political party in the country. In order to effectively rule and remain ahead of his political opponents, Moi established an extensive countrywide system of intelligence collection and reporting using state institutions like never seen before. He turned administrative units, civil servants, into a lethal and effective government operatives directly reporting to his office. These administrators were mandated to review and clear political meetings throughout the country as well as issue licenses for public gatherings. They had to prevent an elected member of parliament from addressing his or her own constituents or arrest and detain anyone they considered to be disloyal or disrespectful to the president. Patronage and loyalty to the president became the new currency for political power. Contesting for an elective position was only allowed for those who swore allegiance and support for the president. Moi took it to another level when he abandoned the secret ballot in primary elections, replacing it with a queuing system under which voters were required to line up behind the agents of candidates holding pictures of each contestant, a procedure open to any amount of abuse. Any candidate who obtained more than 70% at this stage of the voting was returned unopposed. Elections were commonly manipulated to ensure that only his own placement were chosen. Under his rule, there was a widespread network of Kanu secret police called the Special Branch, lurking in the shadows, waiting to pounce on those who dared to express an independent thought or simply to think or act in ways that were not actively sycophantic. Moi's plan was to reduce the population to thoughtless cheerleaders to push national culture and intellectual activity back to ground zero so as to remodel them into Kanu's image. And so, the stage was set for both tragedy and farce. 
For instance, an illiterate Kanu sycophant demanded the immediate arrest of Karl Marx. A member of parliament publicly asked God to take the remaining years of his life and add them to the president's lifespan. The Antony General in Moy's era, Charles Njonjo, authorized police to shoot to kill and ordered the castration of men who criticized Moy. At one point, Njonjo warned Kenyans, quote, It was treason for any Kenyan to imagine the death of the president, even peacefully in his bed. One person who took this sycophancy to a whole new level of art was Peter Olu Alingo, the Minister of Education in Moi's regime. He once exclaimed, A Daniel has come to judgment. On another occasion, the minister declared with a pious conviction that the president was the Prince of Peace. In the same forum, he said, quote, Your Excellency, even the trees, the maize, and the plants sway to the sound of Nyayo Nyayo. Musicians composed songs, some of which stated that animals on the ground and birds in the air were full of reverence and praise for Moi. When Moi visited an area, school children were supposed to wait for him on the roadside and sing praises. This stifling of the atmosphere of political patronage, hero worship, and the ease with which one would end up in a police cell did not leave any room for criticism of Moi. Chinu Achebe says, when hunters learn to shoot without missing, birds learn to fly without patching. Under Moi, university professors of political science learned how to teach their subject without reference to the reality around them. Doctors treated torture victims without asking the cause of injuries. Judges sent to prison people brought before them on a sedition charge, a legal instrument designed to ensure conformity of thought. Moi inhabited the lives of his people. He was everywhere, on banknotes, in office portraits, staring down at the workers, in statues, in the names of airports, sports stadiums, roads, colleges, milk, buses, schools, and hospitals. He stared at you through the numerous eyes of the secret police. Politicians became court poets, competing to see who was more royal to President Moi. To the global community, Moi painted an image of progressive and a responsible Pan-African leader hoping to distance international criticism of his role. Locally, it was a different ball game altogether. He maintained a robust strongman grip to power that showed little regard for human rights. To maintain a facade of belief in human rights abroad, Moi willingly took part in many continental and global peacekeeping missions established to protect human rights principles by sending Kenyan troops to these missions. This was in direct contrast with the level of human rights violations he oversaw in Kenya. There is no better symbolic reminder of Moi's totalitarian rule than the infamous Nyayo torture chambers, hidden in the basement of a 20-story government building in the capital Nairobi. Built in the 1980s, Architectural plans show that the cells were specifically designed as torture chambers with rubber seals under the doors so that prisoners could not be held knee-deep in water and vents to pump cold or hot, dusty air into the rooms. This was the destination for thousands of political activists, academics, students, and artists who were arrested and held in dark waterlogged cells for weeks on end with little food or drinking water. The 26th floor of the Nyayo house was the interrogation room where these prisoners were beaten until they confessed often to fictional crimes. One of the thousands of victims of the Nyayo house torture chambers was Raila Amoro Odinga, a prominent political leader in Kenya who was instrumentally vocal against Moi's dictatorial rule. He was held in the infamous Nyayo torture chambers in 1988 and 1990. Standing at the footsteps of the basement of Nyayo house, Raila, reflecting on his experience, he recalled, First, it was fairly friendly. It was like persuasion. Then, if you persist, the following day, they would become more intimidating threats. After that, the third day, they would become more violent. You would be taken down to be tortured. 
they would begin to pour water in the cells and so on until he finally gave in and confessed. Another hallmark of Moi's repressive regime was the entrenchment of tribalism and ethnically motivated massacres. In 1980, in what is referred to as the Garissa Gobai Massacre, at least 3,000 Somalis in Garissa district in the northeastern part of Kenya were killed. In 1982, Moi's security forces killed and raped women during the Malkamali Massacre, where over 336 people were massacred in cold blood. Furthermore, on the 10th of February 1984, more than 5,000 ethnic Somalis were butchered by the Kenyan security forces under the Moi regime in what is called the Wagara Massacre. The men had been rounded up and driven to the Wagara military airstrip where they were forced to strip and lay naked on the hot tarmac. They were tortured and any that attempted to run away were shot. With regards to governance, Moi equally performed dismally. The amount of corruption exhibited in his era was nowhere during his time on the continent. Spreading from the top, corruption in Kenya became embedded in the system during the Moi years. District commissioners routinely stole cement from donor-funded erosion prevention dams. The director of motor vehicles became rich and politically powerful by demanding bribes from everyone who wants to license a big truck. In Kenya, there was no judiciary but rather a bunch of thieves in white wigs and robes. Why hire a lawyer when you can buy a judge? Ren, a well-known Kenyan saying. An investigation carried out in the post-Moy era found that almost half of Kenya's judges and more than one-third of the magistrates were corrupt. It revealed that the cost of bribery ranged from up to 190,000 US dollars for an appeal court judge to $20,000 for a high court judge, to $2,000 for a magistrate. As little as $500 would quash a murder conviction, while $250 would secure an acquittal on a rape charge. One judge estimated that at least 20% of prison inmates were wrongfully imprisoned because they could not afford to pay the bribe. A tribalist at heart, coming from a subgroup of the minority Kalenjin, a language family, Moi handed out key posts to the Kalenjini members and promoted Kalenjini interests at every opportunity. Using state power to undermine the patronage networks of the old Kikuyu elite established during Kenyatta's regime. The business empire he constructed for himself and his sons included assets in transport, oil distribution, banking, engineering, and land. His inner circle, known as the Cabernet Syndicate after his hometown, became exceedingly rich, obtaining loans from banks and pension funds that they never intended to repay and huge kickbacks from government contracts. Foreign businessmen regularly complained of the bribes that Moy's regime demanded to enable them to start up businesses or to win contracts. Furthermore, Moy was implicated in the 1990s gold bag scandal and the subsequent cover-ups where the Kenyan government subsidized exports of gold far in excess of the foreign currency earnings of the exporters. The scandal cost Kenya the equivalent of more than 10% of its GDP, about $5 million, which was very significant in the 90s. He made a mockery of the investigations and the inquiries into corruption cases flagged by activists and foreign donors. He would set up commissions of inquiry whose findings were either ignored or never publicized. As more people sift through the deceit of Moi's goodness as president in Kenya, many more remember that Moi rule was one of terror and torture in which many Kenyans disappeared. After 24 long years, the curtains came down on the oppressive tenure of the self-confessed professor of politics. Daniel the son of Moi, the one who welcomes back the cattle, was voted out of office in December 2002. He exited public service to his home village in the Rift Valley, where he led a quiet life away from public limelight. But the consequences of his widespread corruption and nepotism during his time continue to haunt Kenya today. 
He died on the 4th of February 2020 and was treated to a statesman send-off complete with military performance. After 24 years in power, investigators estimated that Moyi and his cronies had looted as much as 3 billion US dollars. His successor, Mwai Kibaki spoke of inheriting a country badly ravaged by years of misrule and ineptitude and pledged to root out corruption. Corruption will cease to be a way of life in Kenya, he declared. But no sooner had Moi's cabinet syndicate of the Kalenjin politicians departed than they were replaced by Kibaki's Mount Kenya Mafia of Kikuyu politicians who moved swiftly to set up their own lucrative deals or take over the existing scams. Moi's legacy is a contested issue, with proponents arguing that he was a significant political leader in Kenya's history, who stabilized and united the nation in the 90s, while neighbors like Sudan, Somalia and Ethiopia descended into civil wars, and who handed over power peacefully in 2002 without much incident. In contrast, his critics point to the problems that his regime oversaw and to the centralization of power, the culture of impunity, and a sense of an ethnically biased state with which Kenyans still grapple with today. Be that as it may, there are constructive lessons that can be drawn from his 24-year rule of Kenya, both good and bad. After all, Daniel Tirotich Arap Moi was a human being. He will be a national hero for many, an unrelenting villain for just as many. <laughs>